praise his name. Father, we're at this moment in time where we break the bread of life. The bread that will sustain us, the bread that will carry us, the bread that fills our longing soul, the bread that you said that we must take and eat of and take it in because of salvation to our souls. So, Lord, we hear we need you. Speak, Lord. Speak to my heart, Holy Spirit. Give me the words I long to hear. Lord, we need to hear from you. There's so many voices out there in the world that is saying all so many things. There's voices in the atmosphere, voices on social media, voices in the community. There's a lot of voices, but we need to hear one voice, and that's yours. So, Lord, speak now. Somebody's night was too long. Somebody's burden was too heavy. Somebody asked the world to stop spinning so they could get off. They need a word from you, a word of encouragement, a word of conviction, a word of hope in these desperate times. Lord, weather conditions are bad. Violence is at an all-time high. Lord, there's no place we almost feel safe. But we're thankful that we can be safe in your arms. So, Lord, we need to hear from you. Stand in this place. Speak through me as an oracle, as a herald of your gospel, and we'll give you the praise. In Jesus' name, yeah. amen. amen. Are you thankful for the praise service today? Yes. Oh, yeah. you thankful for the praise service today? I love it when we all sing together. Uh, I like singing in my car. I like singing in the shower. I like singing. I don't like singing in front of y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can sing good when I'm by myself, but when I get in front of y'all, I don't know what my tune is. I'm so glad we got music. Give our musicians a hand. I'm so glad we got music. We can do without, we can be without music, but I'm so glad we got music. I see my family here, my cousin Monica and all her 10 kids. So give, my, give them some of my family right here. Give them a hand today. Amen. They came sneaking in on me. They said it was going to surprise me. I knew they was coming because y'all said it. Yana and them didn't come, though, huh? <laughs> Where they at? Around the corner. Boy, they're going to be late for everything. <laughs> but anyway, we thank for the God for my family being here. My daughter and them is down in San, San Diego. Um, I've been on her case because she's been promising since January. I'm going to come at least once a month, Dad, and now it's May and she ain't, April, she ain't came yet. I told her the other day when she called, she FaceTimed me last night. Y'all supposed to be coming. You know, it's up to us to tell our families to come. We want everybody else to come, but we need to, we need to bring our families back home. We need to feel that, uh, redeem that sense of family. Jesus Christ was a family man. His last words on the cross, one of them was that, uh, look after my mother. He was, he was about family. So we need to be about family today. Isn't that right? Yeah. I'm filibustering right now for them to get here so they can hear the word, but I ain't going to hold y'all too long. I ain't going to hold y'all too long. It's good to see each and every one of you. Hey, and Toby just shot, you did my heart good, Toby, coming in here. I, I'm not calling her out. Don't, uh, uh, we, go, we go way back, the Alarms family and us go way back. We was all at Kavanaugh and Green Oaks and everywhere all together. And, you know, we're still here. I'm thankful to God that we're still here. I'm thankful to God that your mom is still here. A lot of us, you know, you, I know you cherish her, you're looking after her, and I appreciate you for that. Too often we want to just put them away so we can go do our own thing. But we need to cherish our families because, you know, when they lay in here, whatever you say don't matter to them. Let somebody know you love them while they're here. Is that all right? Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, it's Resurrection Sunday. Resurrection, they, that's the day he got up. If I was going to close right now, I would say early. <laughs> then y'all get on your feet and want to shout early. <laughs> but we're not early yet. We're not there yet. So hold on. <laughs> Hold on, we'll get there. Uh, we've been on our series, Redemption, The Road to Redemption Through the Cross. This is going to be our last part of that series. Um, too often, we make this day about everything except the event that happened. We make this about the Easter bunny, we make it about the Easter egg, we make it about hunting, and 
we have celebrations, but I, I'm, 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 I'm saddened that we lose the magnitude and the seriousness of what Jesus did while he lived and while he died and while he rose. The reason why we have hope is because of what he did. And while we may celebrate, and Jesus loves celebrations, he went to feasts, he turned water into wine, he loves celebrations, but we don't need to forget what we're celebrating and why we're celebrating. It's important to understand the magnitude of what this day represents. Not only that, it's important to understand the value that God placed on you because of the magnitude of what he did today. This is all about the value that God placed on you. You need to understand whether somebody else thinks you're valuable or not. God thought you was worth dying for. We want to die for everything else except die for the right reasons. We got people in prison that will roll with somebody until the wheels fall off, but Jesus want to break you out of prison. He don't want to put you in prison. He want to free you from prison. And we need to understand the magnitude and the value that God places on you. He places value on you, and that's what is important about celebrating each and every Sunday, and especially the day we set aside, as we call Resurrection Sunday. It's important to understand those things. Stand with me as we read the scripture this morning. We want to read out of John 19, verse 28 through 30. John 19. All weekend long, people were, especially on, on Good Friday, they were all preaching snippets, what they call the seven last sayings on the cross. And I think sometime in those snippets, we lose the importance of what he was saying. This is one of them, but is it really important to look at what Jesus did? John 19, verse 28 through 30 says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up the ghost. The road to redemption through the cross, and the final is, it is finished. It is finished. Say it with me. It is finished. You may be seated. As we conclude this series on the road to redemption through the cross, the goal was to bring the proper perspective to the magnitude of the cost of human redemption. The proper perspective to the cost. You know, it costs God to redeem you. From very early in the Garden of, Gets, uh, of, of Eden, he was in the process of redeeming. And we know from the previous uh, messages on this topic that the, the, the plan of salvation was foreordained. That means it was preordained. That means that God knew before he even created you that he had to have a plan because he knew what you would be susceptible to. You see, we have this German of that we want to be self-important. We have this thing we call pride, and our pride is not the pride of being in the community. Our pride is one of selfishness, where we are more important than the other person. We measure ourselves against other people. So Jesus was foreordained to come to try to break us from that bind that we have that makes us selfish, self-centered, and only interested in self. So the goal was to bring the proper perspective to the magnitude of the cost of human redemption. This is of critical importance because the greatest event in human history is shrouded or covered in fables. It's mixed up with fantastical myths of rabbits and eggs and other stories that detract from what God did to recover his most precious creation. He did that to recover his most precious creation. The creation event was marred by paradise lost. You know, we lost paradise. We were in paradise in the Garden of Eden. But sin ca ca caused us to get kicked out the garden, so that's paradise lost. Christ came to restore us to paradise. The crucifixion event 
is the cost for the restoration of paradise. To bring us back to where God brought, where he created us to be. Bring us back to us, one person say, our oughtness, who we ought to be, who we should be. He died to bring us back to paradise that we lost. God's most precious creation. You do re recognize that you are his most precious, precious creation. He spoke everything else in existence, but he took personal interest in creating you. He formed you. He, he, if you read the, the creation account, he, spoke to, he said, let there be light. He spoke light. He spoke to the earth and it, it, uh, it produced. He had the animals come out of the earth, but he did not just speak you in existence. He took personal interest in you. He formed you anthropomorphically. He formed you from the dust of the ground. But he didn't stop right there because you had just been dusty. He breathed into you. He breathed. God breathed. That's why you live. You know, God is a source of life. You, wouldn't be, you would just be a form laying in dust if he didn't breathe into you. But he breathed in you. And he breathed in you. That means he imparted himself in you. God gave you of himself. That's why you're precious. There's no other creation he made that he, you hear about him breathing into you. And he breathed into him the breath of life. And humanity became a living soul. He breathed eternity into you. He breathed, it, he breathed his likeness into you. He breathed his attributes into you. That's why you're able to make things. You ever wonder how they made it? Who came up with the idea of a computer that have a brain? Now we so, in, I was telling somebody, we so uh, dependent on artificial intelligence, we lose our human intelligence. I have a hard time with artificial intelligence. Manuel always laughs at me. I'm always messing up on this live stream. I, I, artificial intelligence is beyond me. I need human intelligence. God gave me more. If I could create that, I need to still maintain my intelligence and not be so dependent on these things. Think, do you know artificial, uh, let me say this parenthetically, there, it tells you what to buy. Have you ever noticed that? It says, you like this, so here, let me, get, let me pop up all these ads for the things you like. And you know what we do? Because I do it too. I'm ordering from Amazon Prime all the time. <laughs> I got to stop. I'm hooked on Amazon Prime. But God gave you his intelligence. He breathed into you and he gave you a mind that you can have a will, you can have make decisions, that you can love, that you can, you can form relationships. God breathed into you. We lost that in sin. So the crucifixion event is the cause for the restoration of paradise. God's most precious creation, the only one in creation that God made to be in his image, the only one that God gave the stewardship of his world, the only one who was created to be in close personal relationship with him, lost paradise because of selfish ambition and pride. Today is a celebration of the greatest sacrifice in eternity. Today, is the day of celebration of the greatest sacrifice. I'm not saying in the world is beyond the world because we eternal creatures in eternity. Sacrifice. We throw that word around so lightly. Sacrifice. What is sacrifice? Jesus sacrificed himself. Abraham sacrificed the lamb. Jesus called himself the lamb of God who is coming to be sacrificed to take away the sins of the world. Sacrifice costs something. It's life. If we understand that it costs, when we sing that there's power in the blood and because he shed his blood, your life blood, once your blood is gone out of your body, you have no more life. So when we said he shed his blood, that means he gave his life. Sacrifice. To give up something important for the benefit of someone else. Sacrifice. To give up something important for the benefit of somebody else. That means that you're putting somebody else before yourself. Come on, come on. That means that God said you're so valuable that I'm going to give up. Jesus said I'm going to come down. I'm going to take on a human body. We miss it. He didn't have to do it, but I'm sacrificing. I'm, I'm coming down. I'm going to take on a human body. I'm going to come through for another person. It's for their benefit. It's the act of. Sacrifice is a verb. It's the act of. It's the act of giving up something that is important to you in order to help someone else. 
suffering loss. Sacrifice involves suffering. It involves giving up. We don't want to do that. We don't sacrifice. Now, parents do sacrifice for their kids and grandkids. That's a form of sacrifice when you stay up late at night or when you got to work two jobs to feed somebody and you invest your life. That's, that's a sacrifice. Too often, our kids are just like us. We don't appreciate the sacrifice of parents. Yeah, no. Y'all don't appreciate nothing. Y'all, y'all have said that. Amen. Y'all said to y'all kids, you know, God probably said, y'all don't appreciate nothing. We sacrifice, but we haven't sacrificed to this enormity. And not only that, this is a price that we couldn't pay. So Jesus Christ came and sacrificed his life. He sacrificed his place in glory to come down. He sacrificed that he had to uh, bear your burden. He sacrificed that he took abuse. That was sacrifice. How are you going to slap God? How are you going to kick God? How are you going to curse God? How are you going to tell God that he's a devil? He came down and took all that abuse. God came down and he walked and he and people just abused him. The religious leaders didn't love him. The religious leaders want to turn against him. But God came down. He said, I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to sacrifice the glory that I have. I'm going to allow people to treat me any kind of way because they need me. They need what I have to give them in order to bring them back to paradise. In John chapter 7, verse 6 through 8 and verse 30, Jesus said, my time has not yet come. When we talk about it as finished, there was other times where they wanted to kill Jesus. In this one account in John chapter 7, they were questioning him about how do you do the things you do and why do you do the things you do and, and, and by what authority do you do the things you do? Why? His brothers told him, you need to go to Jerusalem. It's Passover time. They said, you need to go to Jerusalem because everybody's wondering what you're doing. You've been doing all these miracles and everybody wants to see a miracle. They want to see a show. They didn't want to see a miracle because it was good. They wanted to see a show. They wanted to see, look, like it's a magic trick, like you would go to a carnival. Jesus told them in this pericope that my time has not yet come, but your time is already. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that the works were evil. You go up to this feast. I'm not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. Later on in verse 30, he did go up to the feast. If you read in verse 30, he did go up to the feast, and they questioned him, and they therefore, in verse 30, they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. You see, the plan was not finished early on. People wanted to kill him way early, but they couldn't kill him early because he had not completed what he came to do. There are many times when religious leaders looked to kill Jesus. During the Feast of the Tabernacles, his brothers wanted him to show himself in Judea. He told them that his time had not yet come. It wasn't time yet for my death. He tells them to go ahead because his time had not yet come. He goes into Jerusalem and the religious leaders, you know today religious leaders are still confronting Jesus? Even while they're trying to preach Jesus, they're not trying to live him. Some people are using it for their own gain. They want it for financial gain. They want it for social prestige. They want to be elevated above other people. Jesus didn't elevate himself. He walked with you. And every pastor you have should walk with you. You can't herd sheep unless you smell like sheep. You're going to be in elements with the sheep. You can be of the world, but you don't have to be, uh, you, you can be uh, in the world, but not of the world. But you have to walk among the people. You got to go, people. You know, I go to places that you wouldn't go because we as religious people think we better. Jesus went to the slums of Judea. He went to outcast woman, a woman who was living in moral life. He sat down and talked with her when everybody else thought they were no good. He goes to people that didn't know him. We, we can't just sit in here and wait for people to come. We need to go and tell people and invite them to come. You got to live among them. You, hey, they don't have to influence you. You should be an influencer in their lives. You should influence them for good. Be an example. I can go with them, but I ain't got to do what they do. I'll go to the sugar shack and shake hands and, 
hug everybody, and pray for them. But then I leave. I'm not of the world, but I'm in the world. And they may never, ever walk through this door, but I need to go to them because they may need me at that time. I go to community events because they may need me. I am, uh, I am in the world. And while I'm in the world, I need to have a positive impact. That's what Jesus did. So he set the example that we should be in the world, influence the world for good, but don't take on the bad influences of the world. Are you with me? He goes into Jerusalem and religious people confront him. What are you doing? You hanging out with publicans and sinners. You hanging out with outcasts. You hang out with whoremongers and adulterers. You hanging out with thieves. Why are you doing that? I did not come for the righteous. I came for sinners. Somebody will say amen. Y'all don't know what you're going to shout. I didn't come for the righteous. You think you're already righteous? I can't come for you. But I came for those that, that know they need me. I came for those that know they need help. That's who I came for. I can't help you. Amen. I came for sinners. So he goes, they accuse him. They told him he was possessed of a demon. They tried to kill him. But it was not time yet. This is critical to our text today because we've arrived at another time. In our discussion this morning, we're at a specific time in history. The Greek word for it is finished is tetelestai. I don't speak Greek. But it really means that to cause to happen for some end result. It means to make happen, to fulfill, to bring to fruition, to accomplish. It means fulfillment, to bring to an end. Finish, complete, carry out, accomplish, perform, fulfilling, keep. It means to pay. Now we're at the point. After Jesus walked and talked and taught, now at, we, at this point where we're at, prior to this, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane because, you know, in his humanity, he didn't want to feel pain. We try to paint Jesus as this God figure that could just handle anything. In his humanity, he did not want to feel pain. That's why he know what you feel. He did not want to feel, and he was the God man. He was all God and all man. In his human part, he could feel what you feel. He could feel pain. So he goes, knowing that his time is coming, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he prays, I need, I need strength in my humanity I know what I need to do. I know what I have to go to, but I need to be able to go there and fulfill what you called me and what you sent me to do. So he goes there, and he's under great stress. Have you been under so much stress that your head is pounding because of the pressure of life? He understood that because he went through the pressure. And he prays in the garden until sweat like blood runs from him, and he brought people with him to support him. Have you ever had people, you say, come hang with me for a minute, I need you, and they too tired. That's what he had. His best friend said, pray with me for a while. Sit here, pray with me for a while. I need your support because it's time is here. The time is coming. They're going to put me in the hands of ungodly people, and they're going to kill me. It's that time now, but I need your support, and they couldn't support him. So he's in the garden. He's praying by himself, and he says what everybody says. Three times he says, not my will. But thy will be done. Your will be done. He had to be able to submit to God's plan, to submit to why he came. In his humanity, it was too difficult. But he had to submit because you couldn't pay your cost. Then he understands betrayal. His best friend he'd been walking with three years, feeding him. He's seeing all the miracles. He sell him out for 30 pieces of silver. And you know how he betrays them? He betrays them with a kiss. A kiss is a sign of affection. So he comes to him, hey, Jesus. Mm. And, oh, that's the one. The one I kiss, that's the one. Being deceptive already. He understands betrayal. Then he understands people taking him and accusing him wrongly. His time is coming. Right now, still not there yet, but he's in the process of going to finish what he started, what he came to do. Finally, they bring him to where he is, on the cross. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? 
We, we like for Jesus to bear the cross alone. But there's a cross for everyone. There's a cross for me. Our cross is to go into all the world and share the gospel. We need to carry what he did, carry on what he did. So he goes and they beat him and they kick him and they stomp him and they spit on him and they put a crown of thorns. We see all those things. We mythologize. We, 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 we make it something light. But he's serious about what's going on because he's being abused by those who said they know God. That they went to, the, those that went to seminary and said, I can interpret the scriptures. He's being abused by them today. We abuse God by misusing his word. Then they beat him and they bring him before the governor and they try him. They say he's not, in, he, they say he's not guilty, but they condemn him as if he is. Wrongly condemned. His t- hour is coming. He's right at the point where he's about to finish what he started for you. The intended hour of Jesus' glorification had arrived. He is accused, he is tried, he is convicted, he is beaten, and he is questioned why is he here at this junction in human history? Why are you here? Who are you? What authority do you have? His time had come to complete his mission. And he could shout, it is finished. The king had been crucified and was dying. The sacrifice for sin and the appeasement of God's wrath was occurring. He's on the cross. His mother is there watching him. The whole world is there watching him. He's stripped naked. Imagine you stripped naked and hung out in front of everybody. How embarrassing that is. <coughs> Imagine that. We put on clothes to cover us up. They, they, they showed him to all the world in a beaten form. As a sacrifice for sin and an appeasement of God's wrath. He's on the cross and he declares victory. He declares it with strength. He declares it with authority. It is finished. I have completed what I started to do. He completes the mission by dying and giving up his life, laying it down. It is finished. That word in Greek and in Latin mean it is finished. The question is, what was finished? What was the it that was finished? The it is the work or the mission that he was sent to do. That's what we missed. The it was, I came to do something. The it was, I came for them. The it was that I'm going to die for them. The it was that salvation would be complete. The it was that redemption would happen. The it was that you have an opportunity to recover your relationship with God. That was it. It was finished. The work or mission he was sent to do, he fulfilled the scripture that prophesied that he would come. The payment of the sins of the world was finished. As the Lamb of God, he had taken away the sins of the world. Jesus, he is in control, and he releases his spirit. You know, they tried to kill him. I mentioned earlier, they couldn't kill him. You know what? They didn't kill him then. He gave up the ghost. You can't kill life. You can't kill the source of life. You can't kill God. He had to lay down his life. He says, they think they're going to kill me, but I lay down my life because I have the authority to pick it back up again. They're guilty because they tried to kill him. They're guilty because they rejected him. Don't be guilty of rejecting Christ today. He releases his spirit. He says in in that verse, he says, it is finished and bowing his head. He gave up the ghost. The battle is over. That's what it means. The battle is over. The victory is won. The journey is completed. His time had come. It is finished. Because he finished it, because he completed it, because he fulfilled it, because he accomplished it, because he brought it to fruition, because he brought it to an end, because he carried it out. I stand on his finished work. What about you? I stand on his completed work. I rest on his promise. I accept his gift. I see him at the cross. I see him suffering. I see him carrying his cross. I see him being beaten. I see him being accused. I see him carrying a burden. I see him looking at those down there. I see him saving the thief that wanted to be saved. I see him selflessly sacrificing himself for me. I see him. 
I see him wounded for me. Wounded for me. Wounded for me. There on the cross, he was wounded for me. Gone my transgressions. And now I'm free. All because Jesus was wounded for me. It is finished. Dying for me. Dying for me. There on the cross, he was dying for me. Now in his death, my redemption I see. All because Jesus was dying for me. It is finished. Risen for me. Risen for me. Up from the grave, he was risen for me. Now evermore from death's sting, I am free. All because Jesus has risen for me. It is finished. Living for me. Living for me up in the skies, he's living for me. Daily, he's pleading and praying for me. All because Jesus is living for me. He can shout, it is finished. Coming for me. Coming for me. One day to earth, he's coming for me. Then with the joy, his dear face I shall see. Oh, I will praise him because he's coming for me. It is finished. All my sins are nailed to the cross. It is finished. All my sins and transgressions are thrown away in the sea of forgetfulness. It is finished. All my, my feeling like I'm not valued, I see my value because he finished it. It is finished. It's finished. Completed. He did it for you. He did it for me. He hung his head and he died. But I'm so glad that the story doesn't end there. He stayed in the grave all night on Friday. On Saturday, there was uncertainty. Hope was lost. The person who they believed and they thought was gone. They were wandering around. They were disappointed. They were let down because the, they thought he was coming to set the world on fire. They thought he was coming to set up an earthly kingdom. They thought the wrong thing, and now their hope is on the cross, and he's dead. Uncertainty. Then... Sunday morning, they go to the grave. And they walk in there. And they, they stand there. They say, this man is standing there. He says, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Didn't he tell you what was going to happen? He's risen. He's risen. They go and they look. They see the empty grave. That's why you have hope, because the grave is empty. I'm so glad that he came through Mary, but the womb is empty. I'm so glad that he died on the cross, but the cross is empty. I'm so glad they went to the tomb, but the tomb is empty. All because it is finished. It's finished. Now you have a chance to have a right relationship with God. You have a chance to recover your life. You have a chance to make it all over again. Not because you could pay it, because he already paid it. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a trembling stain, but he washed it white as snow. I can hear my Savior say, my strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me, you're all in all. Jesus paid it all. It's finished. There's nothing else you need to do except what he did for you. You can't do it for yourself. Will you give your life to him? You've tried everything else. You tried everything else. You went to everybody else. I would have talked to my psychiatrist. Yeah, I have one. And I said, what do you do? She said, I got to go to a psychiatrist too. I liked her. She was honest. Now, I go to a psychiatrist. I don't think I'm crazy. I, I, all of us a little bit. We all mentally ill for my military stuff. And I was sitting there, and she said, how do you handle all the pressures of life? And I asked her, I said, who do you go to? But I'm going to tell you who I go to. I go to the rock. I go to the rock that's higher than I. I go to the rock. I go to the rock of my salvation. I go to the rock. I go to you because I have to, but I go to the rock. My dependence is on him. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but I lean on his name, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. I go to psychiatrists because they tell me I got to go, but I go to Jesus for my help. Why? Because it's finished. Do you need him today? You've been walking this road. You've been walking 
all this dusty road. You've been traveling this road. Everybody's been telling you stuff. Everybody's been putting you down and telling you no good. But your value is there. He values you. Is there one who needs God today? We invite you to come to him. I tell this all the time. We're traditionally, we say we're opening the doors of the church, but I can't open the doors of the church. I had to walk through those same doors just like you did. Christ is the way to God. Come through him, you become part of the church. Come to him, you become part of the church. Is there one who needs him? He paid it. It's finished. All you got to do is accept it. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus paid it all. Sin had left. He washed it.